Right, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this uh, TPA seminar. I'd like to uh, extend a very warm welcome to everyone who's able to watch this. Um, we chose one till two uh, on the basis that uh, you could eat your sandwiches or eat your salad or drink your soup or whatever you do at lunchtime without interrupting your day. So we hope that's convenient for all those uh, attending. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by our guests, Paul Scully, MP, Rav Reddy, an insolvency lawyer and partner in Katzen, Munchen, Rosenman, and my colleagues, Andy Bailey, uh, an insolvency partner at TBA, and Dave Rutter, our corporate finance manager. The running order for the session, which is due to last for an hour, is that we will shortly hear from Paul about his experiences as a minister. I will then speak about bounce back loans. Dave will then talk uh, about business finance post pandemic scene. Um, and then we'll move on to the panel session, which will be the largest part of the uh, presentation where we've already had a number of questions submitted, which I'll put to the panel. But if you wish to submit questions during the webinar, please feel free to do so using the Q&A tab uh, to do so, uh, whether it's subjects uh, that are not associated with what we're talking about or uh, matters that arise during the course of the seminar. So I'd now like to introduce Paul Scully. Paul was elected as MP for Sutton and Cheam in 2015. Prior to being elected, Paul ran his own SME business for a number of years, so he's well placed to understand the trials and tribulations that business owners face on a daily basis. Paul was appointed Parliamentary Undersecretary of State in Bayes following the 2019 election. Welcome, Paul. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, thank you to uh, everyone for joining. Um, I'm really, it's, it, it's good to be here. It's good to actually uh, be, speak about how to be a minister almost just, just over a year, having uh, been appointed to that role, uh, because it allows me to take stock and look back. I, one thing I, uh, on, on the advent of Alan Duncan releasing his uh, somewhat pointed diaries, I, I do regret is not keeping a diary, not for, because it's for publication, not for um, uh, settling scores, but just because there are some incredible things along the way uh, that happen, so uh, random uh, uh, things along the way as, a, as a, um, a member of parliament and indeed a minister. Uh, Martin will know, I've known Martin for a good long time now uh, in, in Sutton, and you'll know that uh, I became uh, interested in, in politics, in party politics back in 97 as a result of the general election. I'm very much an ac accidental member of parliament. Uh, having uh, seen the Conservative Party lose in 1997, I've always been a Conservative Party or Conservative-minded uh, person. Uh, I, I gave the party £25, you need it more than I do, that was supposed to be the be-all and end-all of it, and I gradually got more uh, roped into local politics and uh, eventually becoming a local councillor and then standing for Parliament over, that, but that was over a 20-year gradual period. And as Martin said, having run small businesses uh, in the meantime. Uh, and then... Um, but, but over that time, my, my, my drive for wanting to stand, I want, didn't want to be an MP just for the sake of it. I only really wanted to be an MP in Sutton and Cheam where, uh, where I could felt I could make a difference. And my big drive was to build a new hospital, to, uh, to get a new school in the area and to sort out our high street as well, which like many high streets up and down the country had that structural issue that, uh, that has affected retail uh, right, right the way through. Um, I'm in a fortunate position that um, we, I'm one of the we're one of the six um, of the first 40 hospitals that are, are looking to be built half a billion pounds in Sutton to build a new hospital. We've got planning permission now for um, a school uh, on the site that I found and 11 and a half million pounds, not with COVID pandemic, obviously all bets are off with the high street at the moment, but we've got 11 and a half million pounds to, uh, to of a future high street fund to tackle that um, the, the high street in Sutton. Uh, and, and look to the future in that area. So all things sound great, uh, but, but clearly it's not. You know, we have to, we have to move on. Things, things move on from here and the next challenge comes on. Uh, over the last few years, I've been fortunate enough to just go from that local issue to some of the national, uh, national topics, but also international topics, having sat on the International Development Committee for many years, looking at our aid and how that not only just helps the most vulnerable in the world, but also how it unlocks doors with soft power, um, and with obviously with the um, the post Brexit world um, starting to try and open up those opportunities 
across the world as well, which led into one of my roles as trade envoy, the Prime Minister's trade envoy for Thailand, Brunei and Myanmar. I'm, I'm actually half Burmese, so uh, being able to travel through Burma to talk about um, religious intolerance and we've seen what's happening at the moment, but also to see how trade and aid really does butt up against each other to open up as you open up some of these countries' economies um, to, to how that tackles um, poverty and uh, prosperity in those countries. But it was a year ago that I was actually at a wedding, uh, a friend's wedding, uh, that I got the call from the, uh, from the Prime Minister who, uh, who phoned me up and said he wanted to make me Minister for London, but also a Bayes Minister. He was originally, uh, I think, had the wrong script in front of him because he made me the science minister. Uh, and it was only the day after that I discovered actually I was to be the, uh, the Minister for Small Businesses. And I've been a really, uh, I've been a really um, uh, relatively low maintenance minister in so much that I don't have these, this big Liam Byrne um, uh, catalog of things that I expect my private office to, uh, to, to expect from me. All I've asked for them is uh, that I want a mug of tea, not a cup of tea, and you call me the minister for small business. When you're five foot seven, uh, then you have a thing about being called the small business minister. And especially when Kwasi Kwarteng, my new boss, I'll call him the tall business minister because he's about six foot seven. So, uh, so we, we've got to get that right. But there's a lot of challenges here because uh, I think my, my full title is the minister for labor markets, consumers and small businesses and minister for London. So I just shorten that to the minister for unintended consequences uh, because all bets are, as I say, are, have been off over the last year um, where we were expecting to look at the employment bill to make flexible work in the default option to see what we can do to encourage employers to change their business model slightly to give more flex to the uh, to a wider um, group of people in, in the in the labor market especially women especially young people who and people are looking at uh, portfo more portfolio careers and of course the gig economy how can we use that in terms of um, encouraging flexible working now it's actually looking back at it it's almost putting the genie back in the bottle how do we work with employers to say um, to really redefine what flexible working is in a post-covid environment with those baked in behavior changes that we're still really discovering um, because you see goldman sachs want everyone back in the office tomorrow you see the likes of nationwide building society who are saying people can work in the future from wherever they want to bp is saying they're going to have a uh, uh, maybe two days uh, a week in the office. And there's lots of uh, talk about the, the we work kind of structures, having clusters of smaller teams working around towns rather than having that daily commute uh, into the office. Because I'm trying to encourage employers to have that flexibility, but to remember that uh, permanently working from home is not the same as flexible working. That's basically just living at work. So for for some of us on the call, it'd be fine because we may have that um, more ability, uh, greater ability to work from home and have that blended uh, mixture of, um, of tenure. But for younger people, especially, especially in a, a place like London where property prices are, are um, high, I see a lot of younger people sitting there propping a laptop at, uh, um, on their knees at the end of their bed in their parents' house or, or, or trying to fight for the dining room table in a, in a, um, with their housemates in a, in a mixed household. So there are real challenges there that we've got to make sure that we address in the, in, in the year or so um, to, to, to come as well. To make sure that younger people are with the, uh, are, are able to rub shoulders with people that have maybe been in their trade for 20 years mm -hmm. as well. So to, to get that sort of uh, ability to have a sniff of a good story if you're a, uh, if you're a journalist, if you're in solvency, obviously to, the, the ability to really work through what may, um, you know, what may not come out of it, just a piece of paper. You guys, are, many of you on the call will be really experienced at, uh, at your work, but you, you'll sniff if something's wrong or you'll just get a sense of the, the right questions to ask. That's important to get that across to younger people coming in through the business, which you don't always get on a Zoom call. You don't always get on a Teams call. It's what I call a, um, this, this is what I call the, uh, the Truman Show uh, version of real life because it's slightly curated. People have worked out what, uh, what is, uh, uh, you know, who's on this call. And you don't always get those um, coffee machine, those, those, those water cooler moments, as they call it, um, in the States. But clearly with the labour market's role, it's slightly wider than that as well. It goes through to how we tackle the gig economy, how we make sure that we, we are, yes, we are trying to make sure that we 
control costs that we may impose on business through regulations, through law, but making sure that we can reflect workers' rights as best we can uh, to strengthen them as, we, as the gig economy really continues to roll out. People enjoy the flexibility of um, having a choice of employers, a choice of their own shifts and times, but we can't have uh, that uh, being exploited by, by road employers. So it's making sure that we get that, that piece right. And similarly with uh, the national minimum wage. In terms of small business, I want to make sure that um, that although furlough was the uh, the, the um, business word of last year, I want to make sure that pivot is the business word of this year. We've seen some fantastic examples of small businesses being able to pivot. And many of you, I'm sure, if you are having takeaways over the over the lockdown, uh, may well have enjoyed some of the meal kits that have been uh, that, that some of the great restaurants are doing. I think Pizza Pilgrims was one of the first to do it. There's, um, they were just starting to expand their businesses in London, um, where they decided to sell, change it as they had to close the restaurant and sell pizzas in a box, uh, where they'd send, they'd send you the dough, they'd send you the various toppings and you'd piece it all together. I'm the sort of person that balks at um, uh, Muller Fruit Corners having to mix my own fruit and yogurt together. So having to cook a whole entire pizza, um, but that's sort of like, slightly Grinch-like because people have enjoyed the experience of getting together and uh, making their own, uh, you know, with, as a family, making their own pizzas. That's part of the experience. And they found that they're selling more of those than they were pizzas in their restaurants. So really good examples. But clearly there are, as well as those opportunities, there are going to be business failures. And uh, you guys will be better placed than I to know that uh, some of the failures that we've seen at the moment, happening at the moment, to, a lot of them are ones that had structural issues going into COVID uh, and as best as we can to uh, to wrap our arms around the economy, the £352 billion worth of financial support that we've, uh, that we've put in through the furlough scheme, through the self-employment scheme, the various grants, the business rates relief, the VAT relief, uh, the time to pay, and of course the loan schemes that we're going to be talking about. Uh, there is no way that we can save every job, save every company. But I am also the hospitality minister, the retail minister. I've just been walking down Sutton High Street, seeing what's happening at the moment on the high street. And although retailers are able to open, there will still come a time where the, we're worried, they are worried about the cliff edges, about the return to business rates, the return of the end of the rent moratorium um, and uh, the, the, uh, the measures that I put, I put forward through uh, Parliament and the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Act about uh, not being able to move um, uh, statutory petitions and, uh, and winding up um, demands um, in, in, in the court as a result of COVID debt. Um, and, so, uh, and, and so there are those issues that still have to play out. Hospitality is exactly the same because the, uh, with hospitality, pubs will not, in particular, will not return to profit until June because at the moment they're still just minimising cash burn and minimising losses as they're able to off, um, open outside. So they, these are all still issues that we're working through, uh, that we're still having to flex without with our support. And it's a challenge, but all routes come back to Treasury. And that's why we have to have a close relationship with, uh, with Treasury and also the Cabinet Office who are working on that roadmap to, 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 uh, to, to come out of, um, into, in, back into one piece as well. So we can get back to just not just reopening, but to the recovery and hopefully for some of these areas, where I talked about structural issues in retail and partly hospitality, we want to make sure that they're more resilient as well. And finally, I'll, I'll just end up with, uh, otherwise I'll just go on all afternoon, but uh, talking about resilience, talking about small business, resilience for small businesses who don't always have that cap capacity as big businesses do to weather some of these storms with the COVID and Brexit coming, coming together. We've talked in our last election about the UK being the best place to start grow and scale a business. What I want to be able to do is take that another step further to make sure it doesn't matter where you are in the UK, you should still be the best place to get access to finance, access to infrastructure, access to network, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking and mentoring, and also access with our DIT colleagues to the ability to encourage you to export and the advice to export as well, to grab hold of some of those opportunities. So that's something I'm always interested in feedback about what's happening around the country to make sure that I can get a, uh, a greater sense of, of, of what we need to put in place to get that consistency, whether you're rural, urban, whichever the developed nations you are in. And hopefully that, of course, the help to grow um, uh, uh, initiatives that were announced in the budget will start to feed into that.
But I'll leave it there. Otherwise, as I say, I will crack on for, for a good few hours and show you my 52 uh, uh, slide PowerPoint presentation. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. All right, that's great. Thank you very much, Paul, for that tremendous insight into your route into Parliament and uh, your current job. Thank you so much. Um, I'm now going to talk about uh, bounce back loans um, and what I see as the consequences of them. Um, I'm sure everyone's heard of bounce back loans who's tuned into this uh, presentation. Um, first of all, the numbers. Um, the final numbers when the scheme closed was that just over 46 and a half billion had been lent on just over one and a half million applications. But interestingly, over half a million applications had been rejected. The loans were up to £50,000 or 25% of turnover, whichever was lower. Businesses self-certified the application documents themselves and lenders were not required to perform any credit or affordability checks. Uh, the loans were 100% guaranteed by the British Business Bank and the government said that no one will be pursued uh, in respect to their personal assets, houses, cars, for repayment of the debts. The loans were interest-free for the first 12 months and then 2.5% for the remainder of the term. And initially, they were repayable over six years, starting 12 months after the date the loan was taken out. Um, the, lap, the period for the loans was originally set up to 31st of October last year, but it was extended three times and eventually ended on the 31st of March this year. There were conditions attached to the loans that applicants should be engaged in trading or commercial activity and have been established by 1st of March 2020. And applicants should not be in bankruptcy or liquidation or undergoing debt restructuring when they applied for the loans. In September 2020, uh, the government introduced what they called pay as you grow, whereby uh, borrowers could request an extension to repay the loan up to 10 years at the same 2.5% rate of interest, that they may reduce the monthly payments for six months, paying interest only up to three times during the term of the loan, and they can request once a six-month payment holiday during the term of the loan in respect of both interest and capital. In respect of all of the uh, loan schemes that were issued, not just the uh, bounce back loans, but all of the various loans, uh, the government had clear short term, medium term and long term objectives in putting the support uh, available to businesses and out there, as Paul says, at tremendous uh, cost to the exchequer. But there were risks associated with the loans and, th and these were recognised from the outset, really. By the government. The government understood that there were going to be risks. Um, and the British Business Bank itself issued a reservation notice. And so the government overrode this and accepted responsibility for the risks through ministerial decision. PwC were asked to carry out a risk review for the British Business Bank, and they identified a fraud risk through the scheme due to self-certification multiple applications, lack of legitimate business, impersonation, and organized crime. And measures were put in place at an early stage um, through the government, which, which is why probably half a million applications, i.e. 25% of applications were rejected to pick up these things. In October 2020, the National Audit uh, office uh, produced a, a report on the uh, various schemes um, and in particular bounce back loans and they said that the risk of fraud had been very high and remained significant but that the initial objectives uh, the chancellors whatever it takes to preserve and save businesses um, had been effective through bounce back loans but that fraud and debt remained significant uh, a significant risk into the future. Now, issues as far as I'm concerned around the loans are that challenger and fintech lenders were authorised to provide 
BBLs uh, in addition to the main clearing banks. Now, whilst, of course, you would expect that, but they were really heavily marketing these and really contacting huge numbers of people, encouraging them to take the loans. And the main clearing banks were contacting their customers and encouraging SME businesses to take the loans, whether they needed them or not, because money was available now. And if you didn't need it uh, in the future, you could repay it. Uh, and it may not be available in the future. So they were really encouraging businesses to take advantage of it. And peer-to-peer -peer lenders, such as Funding Circle, were encouraging their borrowers to obtain BBLs to either service their own debts or to repay their own debts. And I think this is an issue for IPs because all of the peer-to-peer -peer lending is subject to personal guarantee, whereas the BBLs are not. And so directors were potentially putting themselves in a better position by using the borrowing for that purposes. But um, the peer-to-peer -peer lenders are, are always reluctant to give any debt forgiveness. They just want to extend the term of the debt. Uh, and really they had two options, which was to have two months without payment, but then to make up the payment in the months after that, or uh, even before they considered that, they wanted to know whether the business had applied for a bounce back loan. Of course, as I've said, the government did recognize that there would be problems around bounce back loans. And the National Audit Office report that I've alluded to said that uh, between 35 and 60% of borrowers may default on the loans. Uh, the government's original estimates were that ranged between 30 and 75%. And the latest estimates have widened between 15 and 80%, which is a, a huge range, with estimated losses ranging from 6.9 billion in a best case scenario to 27.9 billion in a worst case scenario. Th there's a wide diversity of opinion on whether or not applications were fraudulent. Private Eye reported that up to 33% of applications may have been made on false information, whereas more recently Equifax have said that based on their research, the level of application fraud may be as low as 0.5%. Um, and I guess we'll have to wait some time to find out the true position. Um, I want to talk about the IP114. Um, Dear IPs are uh, directives from the insolvency service to all insolvency practitioners, um, and they're issued on a regular basis. And over the last few months, they've been issued weekly. But Dear IP114, which was issued in December uh, 2020, and, and these include technical updates, um, changes to legislation, and policy updates from both the insolvency de department and other. Uh, departments uh, and are effectively directive to IPs. Put IPs under an obligation to report any abuse of any of the COVID-19 government support schemes as misconduct when submitting their report pursuant to the Company Directors Disqualification Act 1986. Uh, and they said where abuse is identified, there are potentially other reporting obligations to both HMR and C and under AML SAR provisions. M my comments are that whilst some fraud may be clear cut, what constitutes misrepresentation is uncertain. Application forms were simple and often included only four questions before a borrower could obtain the monies within 24 hours. And if a business didn't have accounts, they were asked to estimate their turnout. Um, I've set out on the next slides, and the slides are available on our website or to anyone that requests them after this, the actual content of the uh, IP114, which I don't intend to go through uh, in detail. Um, but I'll, I'll move on to what happens if uh, a business can't repay uh, the bounce back loan, even on the generous terms uh, available. Well, the Insolvency Act 1986, Section 123, has always said, that a company is insolvent if either or it's unable to pay its debts as they fall due, the cash flow test, or 
it's insolvent on a balance sheet basis, the net asset test. And in these circumstances, it's incumbent on the directors to obtain professional advice and take appropriate action. Otherwise, they may leave themselves open to accusations uh, of wrongful trading. So if an insolvency practitioner ascertains that BBLs have been obtained fraudulently, he has reporting obligations to the insolvency service, to HMRC, and under AML SAR procedures. If an insolvency practitioner ascertains that BBL's monies have been misappropriated, it is his or her responsibility to recover those monies for the benefit of creditors, as they would any other antecedent transaction. And so I think the question we'll be asking is, can directors justify that they've spent the monies trying to preserve their business, assuming the application was uh, okay in the first place. Now, I'm interested in the opinion of those attending, and I've set out um, for a poll three questions here, and I'll launch the polling. Um, and these are scenarios that I think uh, we'll face or um, be asked or, or come across on a fairly regular basis. And so I'm really interested in the opinion of the audience uh, as to your views on this. There's obviously not a right or wrong answer. It is just a question of personal opinion. Right, well, I'm going to end the polling now as a large part of the audience has voted. And uh, I think the outcome is roughly as I expected, not necessarily for question two, but the um, split is uh, about 50-50 for most of the options. And I think that's, uh, I'm not surprised, that's what I anticipated it would be um, when we started. So uh, just moving to my uh, conclusion, and these are my own views. Uh, the government did a fantastic job in getting money out of the door very, very quickly, which has saved many SMEs. Repayment terms are generous. Those who have clearly and intentionally abused the scheme should be brought to book. Directors have a moral obligation to repay monies owed in, in every circumstance, but in particular, in this case, where the government has been uh, so generous. But I'm not personally convinced there is much incentive for an SME with a BBL, other debts and uncertain future income streams to do anything other than to liquidate their company and have a fresh start. And I think there needs to be later, greater clarity for IPs around what constitutes misrepresentation as far as the insolvency service and other government bodies are concerned. So that brings to an end my presentation. And now I'm happy to introduce Dave Rutter, uh, who will talk about the current business finance landscape post-pandemic. Thank you, Martin. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you've seen and heard, Martin's been talking about the bounce back loan and the potential issues that need to be addressed uh, going forward. Uh, I thought it'd be worthwhile just reviewing how successful the emergency funding has actually been. Uh, as we all know, hindsight is a wonderful thing, uh, and of course, there's been winners in the main, but there have also been losers. Businesses have not been eligible, and have, for whatever reason, not been able to access the funds that have been made available to them. 
For those of you that are sharp eyed, you'll notice that I've already looked and uh, copied some of the, the numbers that Martin have put up. Um, however, 46.5 billion has been lent to just over one and a half million businesses. This includes the additional 90 million of top ups that were successfully applied for just over by around 100,000 businesses. With regards to civils, the offering came in at 23.3 billion and was lent to just under 100,000 businesses. And civils for larger companies ended up at 5.3 billion to 200, sorry, to 716 companies. Uh, Greensill and Liberty Steel being just two of the companies that run successfully in their applications. Um, in total, to include the future fund, total amount lent was 76.3 billion. Now, as previously mentioned, there were numerous companies that could not apply due to the variety of reasons, and those who did were subsequently declined. So perhaps the replacement offering will assist a number of those who could not qualify, where additional funding will now be available, and hopefully they'll be able to access these funds going forward. I'm sure the vast majority of the audience, if not all, have heard about the new recovery, a new offering called the Recovery Loan Scheme. I've simply taken out what I deem to be some of the key highlights, but please do remember that each lender will have their own appetite and as such may impose their own stricter lending criteria. As you will see, the scheme has already commenced and will run till the year end with expectations that will be reviewed in the autumn. Depending on the success or lack of, there may be changes. Apologies for the overtly complex nature of this slide. What I was trying to demonstrate is that depending upon what type of product a client takes will have an impact on how much they can raise and over what period of time the facility can be used for. Genuinely, I believe that the vast majority of lending will be on a term loan basis, either via the high street or challenger banks, or through the alternative funding sector, mentioned Martin referred to as fintechs. From the borrower's perspective, there are a number of changes. There is no interest-free period or capital repayment holidays. The government previously picked up the savings, sorry, picked up any setting, setting up costs. Uh, these are now paid by the borrower. For loans less than 250,000, no PGs will be required. However, if you look at certain criteria for monitor of the banks, security may be required. So this is all lender driven. Where new starts for those companies that did not qualify previously, again, subject to lender's appetite, there may be opportunities to raise funds and address the historical situations where companies could not raise finance. Currently, there are only a hundred, sorry, currently there are only a handful of accreditors lending, uh, lenders that have been accredited. However, this is expected to reach near to a hundred as was previously done so by the end of the month. Although this does seem optimistic at present. We should all remember that although lenders may be accredited, they will have their own lending parameters and these will be dependent upon their investors' appetite to lend in certain sectors. Will the fintechs that were previously involved come back to the market? Currently, in 20 friends in the banking sector, I gather that initially the banks will only be offering the recovery loan scheme to their existing customer base. It'll be interesting to see how that develops. The question is, is what, have I, what else is available in the marketplace? Due to the success of the Bibbles and Sibbles and the dramatic fall in the scale of large numbers of funders, who have cash to lend and are actively looking to do so. As one would expect, there's still nervousness in certain sectors, despite the lockdown coming to the end. The usual questions are asked. What if lockdown four occurs? Where companies are looking to acquire or refinance assets, the key is the quality of the asset, whether that be a commercial property or plant and machinery. Both the residential and commercial property sectors are active. Development funding is available through both high street and specialist lenders, but are dependent upon areas. A couple of funders are no longer prepared to look at developments in Croydon, as in their opinion, the areas become overdeveloped. 
in the invoice, invoice finance space, there have been a number of changes recently with Barclays Bank selling their factoring book, uh, and both Handels Bank and, and Siemens withdrawing from the sector altogether. A couple of American funds have recently acquired a number of smaller UK players, and it'll be very interesting to see what direction they go into. Just to summarise, not all UK businesses will wish to or be able to utilise the recovery loan scheme. So I've indicated above where we've raised funds for the clients over the last 12 to 18 months. For businesses looking to expand their fleet of vehicles or invest in new modern machinery, we've utilised asset finance. There are still new businesses starting and businesses are expanding and they need to improve their working capital cycle. So we've secured facilities from the invoice finance sector. Where we had businesses that have needed short term funding, uh, it, uh, we've introduced them to providers who provide revolving credit facilities and where clients are paid by credit cards, such as the retail venues that, that's been hit very badly. They've secured finance by providers of merchant cash advances. In terms of bridging finance, again, can be used for a multiple of reasons and is secured against property, normally over a short term and can be expensive. The banks are still keen to lend to good credits with regards to commercial property. And finally, where clients have needed to fund to release goods from the Far East, as in a situation with PPE, or have cash tied up in stock, we've worked with providers who specialise in this sector. It is worth noting that many clients have a number of the above facilities. A couple of, in particular, are what I would describe as true asset-based lending solutions involving four of the above facilities, so they're able to drive their business forward. Oops, sorry. To conclude, I'd like to finish on the changing position with regards to the Crown preference and the impact that will have on funders who are providing stock finance. Due to the change in preference, lenders will need to assess their, their possible risks, and as such, will have to hold reserves to cover possible HMRC liabilities. Now, this can be achieved in a number of ways, such as holding reserves for VAT, PAYE, but it will be dependent on the sector that the clients are operating in. Due to additional risks, funders will be monitoring the credit status of their clients carefully and assessing, as they will always do, new business on its own merits. Do funders retain title on goods through the wholesale cycle or are goods held via third parties to mitigate the funders' risk? This is still an evolving position and what is practical for large operations may simply not be cost effective for the SME sector. The specialist lenders are already looking at ways to secure their positions, and which leads us to find out how the high street lenders will react. And as I say, only time will tell. Many thanks for your time. I'll now pass back to Martin. Thank you very much, David. Uh, uh, and obviously you're more than happy to deal with any queries that anyone has on business finance related matters. Um, if we can move on to the panel session, as I said at the outset, we've had a number of questions submitted already and we'll try and pick up any others that have been submitted during this presentation. Um, so uh, if I can start with the first, which was what are the immediate concerns of businesses as we exit lockdown? And perhaps I can refer this first to Paul because uh, I, I know that you speak to uh, many business groups and trade associations in your capacity as Minister for Business and, and so you'll have good insight on that. Yeah, I think it's one of the really interesting presentations. I think, no, I think it's um, as I um, uh, hinted at in the in my opening remarks. It is very much those getting through those cliff edges. So businesses over the next, as we're getting through the reopening and before we get to recovery, if you like, over the next couple of months, are still minimising losses. But the the key thing is, um, first of all, we want to make sure that this is um, one directional. This roadmap. Because the, the thing that was screaming back at us um, from the autumn was the start stop nature of lockdown was was um, as bad uh, as as the um, as the lockdown itself because a number of businesses, especially hospitality, were uh, were um, becoming were having to were buying in stock and then having to throw it away. 
I noticed one of the chat, um, questions also, Malcolm's question about the event sector. Uh, there are still a number of sectors that have just not been able to open at all. Events being one of them, weddings especially being, being, being one of them. And that's why we're desperately working with the Events Research Program to try and get uh, um, to do, do the pilots for larger events, um, including weddings, sporting events and the like, uh, over, over the next month to report back. So hopefully June the 21st, which is, you know, I know we all say about data, not dates, but June the 21st is the time that we should be touch wood at a point that the economy gets open again but beyond that it will then be as david is and yourself has hinted to with the loan schemes how do we recapitalize those businesses how do we actually get businesses especially smaller businesses that have not had a, an appetite to borrow money in the first place that have taken out some of its finance work work their way back so it's going to be a long recovery even if it's a v-shape in terms of the, the macro numbers for many businesses it's going to be a few years time Thanks. And Prav, can I ask you? Um, I think just from my um, conversations with directors, I think the issue for them is certainty, like having having the runway to re-establish trading conditions and consumer confidence. And I think each, each sector has its own concerns. So when I deal with re retail, hospitality and leisure, obviously, you know, you've got the concerns of the, the high street, those issues. I think for businesses... There's issues with commercial properties, lease obligations um, and floor space. What's the landscape going to look like when there's a more return to work? Um, are they going to need that, that office space? Are they able to, to extract themselves from, um, from certain leases? Th those sorts of things. All of those issues, I think, you can't make decisions at the moment necessarily because you know, like, like David said and Paul said, what happens if there's lockdown for? One of the big questions, actually, Martin, sorry, I'd, I'd just be interested to get the panel's views either now or later on, is the de debate between uh, landlord and tenant, because that's one of the things that, you know, government can only do so much there, right, unless we legislate, it's how do you have those conversations and, and, and get that, that to rent balance um, uh, uh, right, as we call well, it. Well, 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 that's an interesting digression, and maybe I can come back to Prav on that, because I, I know you both represent both sides, Prav, so... <laughs> both landlords and tenants. Yeah, well, I, I think um, at the moment you, you'll see there's a number of the CVAs that even pre-pandemic as well, um, and now at the moment, um, a lot of these restructuring plans, um, the new restructuring plans, which which have the ability to cram down certain debts, they're all fo focused on la landlords' positions as well. Um, some of them, um, I think the landlords have been quite receptive on on some of the others. The landlords have taken a, a different view because they're 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 concerned about the template going forward. I think. Sure, um, Andy, um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I suppose yeah, I think it's just uncertainty seems to be the um, the key point whenever I speak to directors and planning planning for the future. Um, it's yeah, how how are we going? How is this upturn going to occur? Um, to what extent and off the back of that, how do I deal with any liabilities that, that I've built up during the last year or so? Okay, and uh, the, the next question we have is, uh, how will banks approach cases later in the year? Um, if I can address this to you, Prab, first, because we work on obviously a number of uh, cases involving banks. Yeah, and I, I think um, this is very case specific and, and to some extent sector specific as well um, uh, we, we've been working on with Martin and, and Andrew uh, certain case a bank acting for banks in the hospitality sector um, I, I've seen with them there's a much more sympathetic approach to things because where there's um, cash flow forecasts you know the directors and companies are trying their best to meet them but obviously they're facing hurdles all the way through and banks appreciate those sorts of positions as well and I think also the other factor um, is the the market because is there any appetite for banks to enforce if the if the market isn't there for them to extract to extract the best value so I think there's often a wait and see approach so Previously, it was December. The restrictions are coming, are, are going to end. They've now been extended till the end of March. Is the, are they going to be extended even further? 
So I think there has been this um, relationship with banks and borrowers to try and to try and you know deal with the deal with the position. And and I I think banks are generally receptive where there's transparency and openness about the position as well. If there's you know if there's promises on certain things that aren't being met, that's that's when the problems occur. I think. Thanks, uh, Paul. I think I think you're absolutely right. Is it is making sure that that that, that relationship uh, remains uh, in in the right balance. Um, you know, one of the reasons that we ended up with so many different loan schemes in the first place was uh, having the match between our our were businesses and wanting to ask for money in the first place in terms of a loan rather than grants and and those grants not being sufficient. Were the banks prepared to do what we wanted them to do and get the money out the door quickly enough? Uh, without the um, uh, taking away the personal guarantees and the and, and increasing the, uh, the, um, uh, the the government guarantee, so we need to keep working with banks. And I have regular meetings with the chief execs of the major banks to uh, to try and uh, you know push to them, get out there and support our small businesses. It's going to be a challenge, sure. clearly, for the reasons you said. Yeah, and Andy, what are your experiences with the cases we're dealing with? Yeah, well, it's really useful just hearing what Paul just said about that interaction between government and banks, because I think uh, I think that will be key because banks are going to have a critical role going forward, especially with the existing loans, because normally with insolvency cases, we will engage with the banks at an early stage to say this is what's happening. Um, and obviously their, their support is key, especially um, with these cases where if we're trying to turn around a business or restructure it. Um, they're, they're clearly in a difficult position to some extent because they will naturally have want to protect their own position as well, make sure that um, they will collect their debt as well as possible. Um, so I think, well, I suppose on some of our cases, we're seeing them make sure that they, they understand and, and they can collect their debt um, as well as possible. But yeah, I think from the bank's perspective, it's going to be a challenging uh, kind of next 12 months in understanding how they can recover the money from the, the companies and from the government if there are defaults and they don't collect those debts. Okay, um, I've got two questions which I probably want to link uh, together. So they are how will banks approach uh, debt later in the year uh, once we get into recovery phase and what impact do, does Crown Preference have on cases and in case uh, anyone attending is, is not aware and you wouldn't automatically be aware. Uh, the Crown were reintroduced as a secondary preferential creditor with effect from 1st of December the last year, 2020, um, which put them back to a, a position that they were previously in on the 15th of September, 2003. So at, at that date under the Enterprise Act 2002, they'd become an unsecured creditor and ranked as unsecured okay. alongside all, all other creditors. Uh, the change with Crown Preference put them into this secondary uh, preferential position behind employee claims uh, in insolvencies, um, but meaning that they are going to be essentially beneficiary for uh, large amounts of their debt in any insolvency. Uh, so perhaps, Prav, if I come to you first, uh, I'll turn that. Um, yeah, of course, yes. Yeah. Um, so this, this this has been a, a big change. Um, so originally this was announced in 2018 and the intention was that it was to come into force in March 2020 and it was delayed due to the pandemic um, and then came into force on the 1st of December 2020. Um, and it does impact um, considerably because it elevates the Crown uh, in respect of particular liabilities, um, VAT, PAYE, national insurance contributions, um, to behind fixed charge holders and cost and expenses of the administration and preferential creditors, but above, most importantly, floating charge holders. And um, I think the appetite in terms of, and, and it's um, the date of the floating charge or the date that tax debts have accrued are irrelevant for that purpose. So it's retrospective. So it's quite a, a wide ranging change. Um, I think, as, as David mentioned in his presentation, uh, the appetite of lenders in that floating space, uh, floating charge area is, is going to be quite important. I think they are going to be asking for 
bigger controls in terms of the monitoring. Um, there may be um, uh, there may be that um, some of the um, companies have to set up SVVs, so certain assets are held in there. Or it may be that where you have an invoice or factoring arrangement, it's taken outside the order of priority. So there's an assignment over, over book debts as you'd ordinarily have as well. But it's going to increase monitoring obligations. It's going to make cash flow more important for businesses and also may have ramifications in terms of PGs and other forms of security as well. Uh, Paul, if I can come to you on this matter. Yeah, and it's something that I don't really have a satisfactory answer for you, uh, in, in, uh, for, that will satisfy you from your side. I mean, obviously, the, clearly the government wants to make sure that, uh, uh, that the taxpayer is protected uh, uh, you know, within all of this. Um, uh, so that's very much the angle. But, uh, but clearly, that is going to have the ramifications that, that Prav said. And I know you've raised it on a number of occasions, Martin, and, uh, and, and as have uh, your associates to Treasury, your colleagues and, uh, and, and associates to Treasury as well, who we're dealing with this so that that's really the best i can give you at the moment sure no no i understand A andy yeah nothing really to add to what prav was saying in terms of i suppose the banks protecting themselves i suppose in a an insolvency scenario they will be nervous about the company going into an insolvency process um and recovering under their floating charge um and i suppose going back to some case scenarios that we've seen it's will they take steps in advance of a, an insolvency process to try and recover their debt before the, the insolvency process takes takes effect? Sure. Well, it is a situation we dealt with pre-Enterprise Act 2002, although um, I, I think that it meant that um, IVAs and CVAs were not um, particularly helpful for uh, trading concerns uh, or for unsecured creditors because of Crown's position and I think we've gone back, back to that scenario therefore reducing the tools available to IPs uh, and I know that R3, our trade body, has made strong representations to government so the hope is that it will be reviewed again at some point in the future. Um, the next question is uh, how worried would, should we be about mental health aspects for business owners? Um, Andy, if I can start with you, because I know this is a, an area of particular interest and concern uh, to you and something you often speak about on LinkedIn and other platforms. Yeah, well, it, it, comes up, it comes up a lot, and in particular at the moment, um, I think it's a real mixed bag of how business owners are coping. So I think with uh, <clears throat> when you speak to them on a regular basis, some will be um, nervous about their company being in a, an insolvent position but the message sometimes is look just don't make sure you're not worsening the position of creditors but have some patience and, and allow yourself some time to recover um, others you know recently I've had somebody who was just crying down the phone and wasn't able to um, reopen they operate in a hair salon um, which was due to reopen imminently just wasn't able to cope with it so they had long covid and, and mental health issues um, off the back of that and it, it just mentally weren't able to cope with reopening and restarting their business um and tied into that i think there's this this fati fatigue for business owners as well which i think we're going to have to take into consideration when we look at what insolvency process business owners are looking at is that they've already gone through a really difficult year how can they do a long-term recovery process to get out of this bearing in mind a lot of them will be in a position where it isn't through any fault of their own and yet they perhaps have got large tax liabilities that they do need to um, repay over a long period of time uh, this then ties into the uncertainty about how will their, their business perform and can it repay its liabilities over time um, and I think this is probably a, a key question for HMRC is how will they approach businesses where they do need this longer term um, payment scheme and um, will they agree to longer term time to pays um, and if if there's company voluntary arrangements being proposed by a business where whereby they will repay their creditors over a longer period of time or what sort of terms will uh, HMRC agree to that as well um, because clearly I don't think business owners will want to agree to top uh, CBAs over, let's say, a, a five-year period. 
to repay tax liabilities that have accrued um, during the course of the last year. So there's a real balancing act there, I think, all tied into to the mental health aspect. Thanks. Um, Paul? So I'm glad you raised it. It's a really important issue that doesn't get uh, raised nearly enough. It's, it, it pops up every now and again in the wider debate, but uh, but not with nearly enough. I, you know, as Martin said at the beginning, I ran my own small businesses for 25 odd years before I was elected. And, and I always say over the last year there, but for the grace of God, go I. You know, I lost two businesses. Uh, I didn't have to wind them up, but uh, they were just relatively small enough to, for me to wind down over a period of time through a couple of recessions. So I've been on both sides, had successes, had losses. Um, but in these extraordinary circumstances, you're absolutely right, Andrew, to raise the issue of the, 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 not the stress, not just of the period, you, the excluded um, the uh, UK and the, the, the forgotten groups have their own stories to tell, but there's lots of um, quieter people that lie behind that. that we've got to re realise with all of our support, with all of our talk about this, this isn't just spreadsheet politics, this is human, this all comes at human costs. And so you talked about HMRC, you know, clearly that sits aside of Treasury, never mind me, but, but we, you know, we'll always make sure that when we're dealing with them, we can push them to give that space, give that scope, because it's so important. You just don't have the, what feels like the machinery of, of state coming down at you from a great height when all you try to do is put food on your table and looking after the livelihoods of your people, your employees that you put so much um, effort and investment into. Sure. Um, Prav, you're a partner in a, a, a U, the UK arm of a US uh, practice. What are the views there? Well, I, th I think I, I was going to say that I think um, as professionals, whether it's the lawyers or the insolvency practitioners, HMRC, I think we've got all got a responsibility um, to be alive to these issues. I can say from a from a court perspective and from a from the judiciary perspective, they're very alive to these issues. So whenever these issues um, are raised, um, judges deal with them and they're very sensitive to these issues as well so it's definitely something that is um in the consideration of everyone at the moment okay um I, i'd now like to or we have another question is uh do we think the revised sip 16 will make a difference sip 16 deals with uh prepack uh, administration sales where changes happen from 30th of uh, april uh, this year. So Prav, can I ask you to comment on that first? Yeah, um, so the, the, this comes into effect on the 30th of April um, this year, where um, essentially it deals with a prepack where there's an intention to make a substantial disposal to a connected person. So ordinarily, um, a former officer of the um, liquidating entity. Um, do, do, do I think it will make a difference? I mean, I think that the position before was that it was voluntary via the prepack pool. Um, I think the consensus of that was the prepack pool didn't really work. So the answer to that is to make it compulsory. Um, uh, do, I, do I think it's going to make a difference? I'm, I'm not sure it will. I think it's going to be a edit, added layer of cost and possibly a delaying factor. Um, and there's also question marks about who the who can undertake this role of, of an evaluator um, in that process. My, my personal view was that there are appropriate safeguards with the insolvency practitioner having to report and justify that transaction, and safeguards within the within the legislation itself if an administrator gets that gets that wrong. Thanks. Um Paul, this is obviously a, a, an issue because there have been a, a number of changes over the years to the way prepack administrations uh, are, are dealt with. And I sort of do understand the friction because uh, I believe that MPs get lots of letters in their post bags of complaints that businesses, uh, sorry, failed businesses, the owners are able to buy the businesses back on the cheap um, uh, and start again the next day. Um, but I suppose from a professional point of view, it is an appropriate mechanism, it saves jobs, it has certain ob objectives. So it's an important tool for us to be able to use. And, and I know that the sort of academic research, the Graham report indicated that there was a greater instance of failure uh, amongst prepacks to connected parties. Um, and my own view uh, of that is that perhaps one 
people don't learn the lessons <laughs> from their first failure, or secondly, that potentially they overpay because they don't want to lose uh, their baby. But that's just you know very much a personal view. I actually put this in, the group, um, in part in the comments because Martin Callan and Lord Callan is the minister in charge of uh, that looks after audit reform and corporate insolvency, etc. But uh, but then I have to do all the work in the Commons side when he's done it in the Lords. And prepacks clearly have a, a, a role to play, uh, an important role to play, but it's how it, exactly as uh, Prab said, how do you actually get that through um, the, the fact that the, 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 the pool, the prepack ball wasn't really um, working sufficiently, but how, to, how, do we, how do we make that, uh, that, that work a little bit better? In terms of the evaluators, I mean, the, the, I think the key thing that I answered when it was raised in, in the debate in the Commons was the fact that you have to have professional indemnity. To, to be able to act as that role. So invariably it will be um, a, a, a practitioner and an IP anyway, but uh, you know, we haven't sort of like specifically written it in, but it, it, that's, the, that's the way it will lead. Okay, and? Um, yeah, I suppose my comments would be, I think, you know, going, everyone, we always agree that it's a, a useful tool um, with the prepack, but um, we can't ignore this perception that there is a, an issue there. Um, whether that perception is accurate or not. Um, I think there's certain things the consultancy profession perhaps can improve on. Um, and I was looking at some of the stats about marketing and, and I think sometimes the, I think IPs don't always market the business and there, there, was, there can be reasons behind that as well, but um, it still seemed like the, the percentage was still quite high that, that weren't marketed. So that could be improved. Um, I think if in terms of evaluators, should evaluate should IPs be the evaluators or could valuation agents be evaluators I think my only concern there is is again is there a perception that everyone's in the same industry knows each other um, and does that really deal with any of those credit concerns um, so again does that lead us back to people like the prepack pool um, to do those types of evaluations and I, I had a look earlier and I see they've rebranded themselves as uh, going to be evaluators with effect from the the first of may i think so uh, again it kind of comes to me as if it's just a compulsory way of making sure the prepack pool are going to be doing some evaluations but uh, okay yeah uh, thanks well uh, i'm conscious that uh, the time is now 203 and our seminar was to run until two o'clock and i myself always get annoyed when they overrun so i'm just going to uh, uh, issue a final question and then bring matters to a, a conclusion um, and that is um, do we expect an avalanche of insolvencies after July this year uh, when measures cease and the, the background to this is that in the calendar year to the 31st of March uh, there have only been or there have been less than 12,000 corporate insolvencies which I think is a record low for 40 years so clearly the support measures ha have worked to protect businesses um, in, in the short term and sorry, Dave, as you haven't said anything, I'll start with your views on this. Well, all I would say, Martin, is that from talking to the banks and, and the fintech lenders, they are all gearing up in their recovery departments. So I think, regrettably, they're expecting to be very, very busy over the coming months. Um, yeah. Obviously, it's, it's not what people want to hear, but um, they're the lenders. You know, they're, in theory, monitoring the performance of their clients very closely. And, and regrettably, they can see that there are going to be... Uh, problems on the horizon so it, it's I think there will be well whether it's an avalanche but there's certainly going to be an increase in the numbers of failures sure uh, Paul yeah I think uh, there is a certain inevitability I mean a lot of people outside the profession that are looking in are just worrying about the pubs working about the restaurants and the shops and, the, and getting the haircut those kind of things they're seeing 21st of June as being the end point of this clearly it's not as, as you rightly said at the beginning you press the pause button and so it's given as many businesses as possible the ability to take the time to restructure, to work through. But as we've heard from Malcolm and the chat about the events uh, industry and those areas that I haven't been able to, to get that support, then, then there is still those concerns. But those cliff edges are coming and we're trying to smooth them out. It's difficult. One um, quick question from the chat, though, was about the additional restrictions grant. And I can say that although Sutton and other local authorities have been slow in some ways to get the money out the door it's partly because it was originally envisaged to be over two financial years now we've had the restart grant come in we're expecting councils to get that money out a lot quicker 
and we're topping up them their money by 425 million quid but they will only top them up once they've spent the original amount so hopefully malcolm and others you'll see that money coming out a lot quicker over the next few weeks great thank you uh, prav um I, I I'm not not sure. I think there will be obviously an uptick in insolvencies. I don't know whether it will be July. Um, I think maybe the some of the restrictions might be extended past that, just to give, like I've said before, this runway to allow some some st st stability. Um, but I, I expect there will be, and, and there's also this issue of this number of zombie companies that have been running, um, and, and when they when they hit the wall, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, Andy? Yeah, well, I think it would just be that initially the, I suppose you've got the backlog from the last year in terms of winding up petitions that haven't been able to get get filed. Um, so there'll be a huge amount of those going through, I'd imagine, um, from July onwards. Sure. Okay, well, uh, in closing, may I thank our guests, Paul Scully and Prab Reddy for, for joining us today and taking the time out for their uh, busy diaries to be with us. Um, I hope you found it helpful and informative. Thank you to all of those who have attended uh, and have a great weekend. Um, I'll end now. Thank you.